afternoon, whenever you're, you're reading this chapter. Um, chapter 27, today the storm. Uh, pretty big chapter, so let's crack in. Chapter 27, the storm. It was the morning of the 23rd. Joseph Beliski had tried to speak to Ruth on the phone, as he had promised, but the line had been so bad that she did not recognise his voice and could hardly hear a word. He seemed to be trying to tell her something of importance, but after several unsuccessful attempts, the line went dead, and that was the end of that. What was it? He was trying to tell her how she longed to see him. The Swiss boat that was to take them over the water was not due for some hours yet, but the family were too impatient to wait. They were down by the lakeside, eager to catch a glimpse of her when she steamed past the distant Swiss shore. They looked very stiff in their best clothes. Edick was wearing one of Rudolph Wolf's suits and Ruth a summer dress of his mother's. Jan was wearing a blue shirt and Bronia a cotton dress too small for her. Both had been given to them in camp. Their faces bronzed by the sun and dirtied by weeks and dusty wandering were unusually clean. They had made valiant efforts to untangle hair that hardly knew what brushes and combs were for. Jan's hair had been so knotted that he found a comb useless and had to resort to a pair of scissors instead. They were so excited that they did not notice how heavy the air was and how dark the clouds. Ludwig was unhappy and kept whimpering, but none of them, not even Jan, seemed to notice. Let's go past the headland over there, said Jan. We'll get a much better view of the lake. It means we have to cross the stream, said Ruth. It's only a trickle, said Jan, for that was true. For during that rainless summer, the stream that wound down the wooded hills to the shore was far emptier than usual. They could not cross it easily. They could cross it easily by jumping from boulder to boulder. Even Bronia need not get her feet wet. I think I'll stay on this side, said Eddie who was out of breath. Good idea, said Ruth. Sit down on that rock till we come back. I promise we shan't be long. Nevertheless, when the three of them were across the stream, she felt suddenly uneasy without Edith. It seemed safe enough, but was it wise to leave him? After a moment's hesitation, she called back to him. Edith, there's a boat pulled up on the shore behind you, and it's half decked in front. Well, what about it, said Eric. You can shelter inside of it rain, said Ruth. It was the first time that anyone had mentioned rain. Soon as the three of them scrambled along the shore towards the headland that Jan had pointed out, the first drops began to fall. Ruth looked back over her shoulder. She waved Eric towards the boat and saw him with a laugh and grimace obey her. Is that the headland, panted Bronia, as her short legs padded along beside her sister? Shall we really see Father's ship coming? Yes, said Ruth. But if she had looked up, she would have seen that the far side of the lake was hidden, and the gathering rain, even the headland that they were making for, was hazy. Suddenly, there was a loud clap of thunder that rolled and echoed far away into the distant Swiss mountains. Lightning streaked through the black clouds, flickered along the wooded hills. The thunder and lightning were the heralds of what came to be known as the Freak Storm of 1945. Those who were caught in it were to remember it with horror all their lives. It was the climax of weeks of oppressive heat in which no rain had fallen. Suddenly, in one huge downpour, the sky shed its burden of rain. It lashed the lake and beat upon their bare heads and soaked them to the skin. The great binding sheets fell. It fell so that they could not see where they were. Their ankles were deep in water. They stumbled onto the lake. Or was it the shore flooding? Ruth felt for Brandy's hand and clung to it. She felt for Jan's too, but he was trying to grip Ludwig's collar and calm him. She caught hold of his shirt. It broke roughly away. We must go back to Eric, she said. That was easier said than done. Her head was numb with the force of the rain. Her eyes half closed, she bumped into a fallen tree, then feeling her way with one free hand groped along the shore. It was some time before she realised that she was going in the wrong direction. Back again slowly, with head bowed and feet floundering in mud and water and swirling pebbles. In the hope that the rain would ease off, they sheltered under a small cliff. 
feel the muddy overhang broke off and almost smothered them. She was running now, pulling the yelling Baronia and shouting to Jan to keep close. They come to a place they did not recognise. A river had burst through the shore and was hurling itself into the lake. We'll never get across. Oh, Eddick, Eddick, Ruth cried. And they stood there with Baronia watching helplessly as the current swept all kinds of things headlong into the lake. Old oil cans, tyres, planks of wood, a wooden seat, part of a landing stage, whole trees. A canoe went by, bottom upwards, a dead sheep, a branch with a cat standing on it, its back arched in terror. Suddenly she realised the rain was easing, and that she could see across the other side. A sudden pang of anxiety struck her. This raging river was the little trickle of stream they had crossed so effortlessly an hour ago. Eddick must be on the other side. But Eddick was not there, nor was the boat which she had told him to shelter in if it rained. Trees were standing in water. There seemed to be hardly any shore at all. The water was all around them, up to their knees and rising higher. With an effort, she pulled Bronia clear and they flopped down onto some muddy ground that the water had not reached yet. Where's Jan gone? panted Bronia. I don't care where he's gone, said Ruth bitterly. I told him to stay with us, but he went after Lidwig. Oh, Eddick, Eddick! Brushing the wet hair from her eyes, she peered out into the lake. If she had stayed in the boat, if he had stayed in the boat, he must have been washed out with it. And all the floatsome and jet stream tossed about in the mud-stained waves. She could see no sign of a boat. Yarn's on the cliff behind, said Bronia. Ruth turned. It was hardly a cliff, little more than a bump in the gr ground clear of the water. Can you see him from up there, Yarn? Ruth called. He wriggled out of my arms and got away, Yarn cried and he was looking inland. I mean, Eddick, can you see his boat? But Jan didn't answer. He was thinking of Ludwig. Ruth ran up to him. She wanted to shake him to pieces for being so selfish, but Bronia was calling. I think I can see Eddick's boat out in the middle of the lake. It's miles away. Again, Ruth swept the hair from her eyes. The boat was hardly more than a dark smear on the waves, but her instinct told her that it was Eddick's and that he was in it. The fear that she felt now was greater than any fear she had ever known before. The boat vanished, and she sunk down with her head in her hands. And all the while the rain poured down, the ever-widening river carried more with it. More trees, more animals dead and alive, more shore junk far out into the lake. It brought with it a rowing boat too. Bronia was first to see it. At once Ruth jumped up and waded out for it. It was quite close to the bank, bumping along sluggishly, for it seemed half full of water. Nevertheless, when she caught hold of the side, it almost carried her away. It would have done so if Jan not waded in to help. Go away and look for your dog, said Ruth bitterly. You don't care about Eric. Go away. I hate you. But, Eric, but Jan clung on. Together they dragged the boat clear of the current and on to the mud. They managed to tip some, out some water. They found an oar jammed under the seats. In the locker at the stern was some rope to a baler. There were no rowlocks. They worked to make her ship shape as they could. Ruth knew what she wanted to do now, but she did not speak of it. Instead, she lashed yarn with her tongue. You never cared about us. All you ever think about is your blessed animals. Look, there's Ludwig up by the road. Run after him and don't come back. Bronia and I can save Eddick without you. The two girls jumped into the boat and needed no pushing for the water was already round it. Jan was still gazing up the road at Ludwig. The dog was running round and round in circles, crazy with fear, half blinded by the rain, now making a sudden bolt in land. It was a bitter moment for Jan. More than anything in the world, he wanted to go after Ludwig. But Ruth's words had hurt him. They had stirred something deep down in his heart, and he hesitated. With a great effort of will, he shed Ludwig from his mind and turned to his friends. In Ruth's face, he saw what he had hardly noticed before. Though they had not long been there, 
courage, self-sacrifice and greatness of heart, he hesitated no longer. He had lost Ludwig, but he had not lost Ruth, and the treasure box was still safe under his arm. He threw the box into the boat, jumped in and seized the oar. Sliding the oar over the stern, he shoved the boat into the current. In that moment of decision, Jan began to grow up. And the boat was caught up in the swirl of the water and thrust far out into the lake towards the heart of the storm. Okay, so that's the end of chapter 27, The Storm. Not much work to do today, only five questions. So you should be able to get through this one pretty quickly and then carry on with your independent works. Better still, you can go back and look at the creative activities that you haven't done yet and do those ones. Okay, I look forward to seeing chapter 27 with lots of detail and evidence from the story to back up your answers.